Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next edition of the Cisco Modeling Labs webinar series. Um, this time we've got an exciting show for you. We're talking about the brand new 2.6 release. It's got some great new features in it. Um, I myself have just installed it both personally and on my uh, cluster installation, and I'm already uh, loving some of the changes that you're going to see today. Um, we have got an excellent uh, panel. We'll talk about them in a second. And we've got time set aside for you to submit your questions in the WebEx uh, Q&A panel so that you can, you can get your specific answer, whether it be about current CML features or things that we've got planned. Um, be sure to think about those questions. We've got some interactivity, so we'll be asking you some things as well. Um, so please hit our, hit our, our panel. panel. We'll oh. talk about um, the way we're going to break things down today, we've got my introduction. I'm Joe Clark. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a second. Um, then we've got uh, a, a kind of an overview of something that's not very visibly, uh, not something that we can't really visibly show you in 2.6, which is our new AWS support. Then we will show you some of the exciting new features, the things that are really eye-catching and visible. Um, so we've got two of our core developers that will be going through that. Uh, all the while, we'll be polling you, but we have at the end of the demo, we have a, a, a separate polling question. And then, then it's your time to ask us, what questions do you have around uh, CML? And finally, we'll, we'll close things out and uh, offer some next steps. Hopefully that sounds okay. Our panel today consists of me. I am kind of nobody. I'm just here to facilitate everything. Uh, my name is Joe Clark. I work with the CML team, so I'm, I'm fortunate enough to... Uh, to be able to interact with them. I myself, though, am more of a user, um, and I'm making heavy use of CML, um, both in my quote-unquote day job, as well as in prepping for our next Cisco Live event. So I use CML as a way to uh, test some of what I'm doing from an automation perspective on the Cisco Live data center. Uh, with us as well on the panel, we have uh, our engineering side of things, and that's Tom Bryan, uh, Justin Guagliata, and Ralph Schmeider. Um, you're going to hear from two of them uh, today. Uh, in, in fact, you're going to hear from virtual Ralph on a video. Um, and then we have the engineering lead, that's John Ernst, and our product manager, Dalton Ortega. Uh, Dalton will be going through some of the, uh, as I mentioned, the AWS, not very visible, but an exciting new feature in CML 2.6. Um, and uh, Ramal Kocheri, he's here from our support. I'm sure that if any of you are CML enterprise or education users out there, you have probably had a chance to talk to Ramal. Uh, he is solving CML problems globally all the time, every day uh, for our customers. So it's great to have everyone here. Uh, so we have a, a complete coverage for any of the questions um, that you feel you need to get off your chest with regard to CML. So with that, I did it in a little under uh, under five minutes so we can save a little bit more time uh, for your Q&A and to look at some of this demo. Uh, but I'd like to open things up with our first polling question. What do you use CML for today? So you can scan this QR code, but it's going to briefly go away and be replaced with this QR code. Um, so scan it, it's the same thing. And then tell us if you use CML today, and you can say you don't use it today, but if you use it, let us know what you're using it for. Give us some, some insight into how you think uh, CML is helpful to you, um, kind of the use cases that you have, the work that you're currently doing in it. Uh, good, we got some people typing. As I mentioned, I'm using it um, primarily for network testing, like design. Yep, absolutely. So. Uh, on that automation front, last year, I was using it to design a Cisco NSO service around the data center. So it was absolute design, um, practice and teething, interesting, but practice, absolutely. Um, I've used it to uh, practice for uh, making sure I understand kind of a, a concept in networking. Um, most recently, I needed to test that I understood Q and Q correctly, um, and CML was great for that. And now what's showing up as uh, absolutely number one is CERT prep. Um, 
yes, if you are getting ready for CCNA, CCMP, even CCIE, being able to put sample labs topologies up in CML and then test out the, the various scenarios, like can I troubleshoot BGP as an example, CML is fantastic for that. And in fact, some of the features, uh, one of the features that we got in the previous release in 2.5 uh, with respect to annotations even makes it easier to kind of compartmentalize different parts of that topology within CML specifically for doing things like like cert prep. Ah, I like teaching. Um, that is, is a fantastic one. Um, obviously, we have an enterprise-focused version of CML for high schools, colleges, uh, but people are using it as, as kind of a mentoring tool as well. Like uh, I, I may get on a, a conference call with someone and it's so much easier to explain them a concept when you're actually walking them through how it will work or showing them the live show commands from a network as opposed to just talking about it in abstract. So absolutely teaching is, is phenomenal. And I, I saw one there. I, I really love that we've got someone uh, using it for that, CICD. Um, so continuous integration, continuous deployment of, of network or infrastructure as code, that's absolutely something that, that uh, Justin, Ralph, Tom, and I have espoused at Cisco Live. We, we've done a lab on how you can, now it's getting even more popular, we've done a lab on how you can use CML um, to test out, to do a, a test-based design or test-based changes in your network, validate those changes are going to work, and then when they do, push them into production. Um, so because of CML's uh, API and its ability to be automated, it fits very nicely into that CICD. And I also see DevOps up there. So it fits very nicely into, um, into that uh, motif. And, and the last thing I'll, I'll talk about before uh, I hand it over to Dalton, because um, this came up at our last Cisco Live conference in Las Vegas. Someone wrote home lab and test some Cisco commands. The comment that came up at Cisco Live, which it, it was kind of eye-opening, was a, a longtime CCIE stood up and said, when I was coming up, we could always find gear. We would go to eBay and we would get these racks, and this is how we learn networking. Um, and now it's just, it's harder to do that. They're, they're, the, the gear, it, it, licensing for the gear, for modern gear is not easy to get. And the unlicensed stuff is, is maybe too old to be able to be practical. And that's where CML really fits in. It gives you modern or access to modern uh, operating systems and modern features for you to test out what networks look like today and ignite that spark that you might have in terms of, of wanting to build networks and wanting to be a network engineer. Um, so I really like that people are using it at, at, at home lab or augmenting uh, how I use it. I've got one or two physical devices and I can augment my home lab. So this is great. These are, these are uh, great use cases, some, some uh, great things that you're using CML for today. Um, and I hope that you find that what we're bringing in 2.6 uh, and beyond is going to help you uh, use CML or help CML be even more powerful and more effective for you. So thanks for sharing all of that. And we'll capture all of this in, uh, in Slido after the fact. So with that, I would like to hand things over to our product manager, Dalton Ortega, who will walk us through the, uh, the new AWS feature with CML. Dalton. Thanks, Joe. Much appreciated. So I'll very quickly go through a intro to CML for those of you who are not super familiar with it. Uh, then I'll talk about AWS before passing it along to our developers for the live demo. But yeah, if you're not familiar with CML, it's a great product. It's a browser-based software product where you can configure, you can do your testing and network design prior to actually deploying into a production environment or into your actual network. Um, you know, the real big benefit of doing this kind of virtual or this kind of early testing and configuration uh, virtually is you have the ability to save a ton of space and time and you don't have to worry about lead times and shipping and all that of the actual hardware. So you can set up your labs, you can set up multiple labs actually within CML and test out multiple architectures uh, well in advance of actually receiving the actual hardware. So whether you're doing a home network or you're working with inside of an organization, this is great to get up to speed. Um, it does come with a lot of Cisco images, everything from like iOS to Nexus devices, um, and a few in between. We've got some open source images as well, like a traffic generator that ships. But I wanted to let you know that it's not limited to just what you have shipped standard with the 
uh, CML ref plat package. You can also expand that to other Cisco devices. So we've seen a lot of customers that have entitlement for like SD-WAN and Firepower uh, bring in those devices into CML, but you can also bring in from third party as well. So let us know if you have any questions on that. We can see some documentation on how to actually create custom node definitions for those images from other vendors. Um, and likewise, you know, there's a lot of different use cases for CML. So, you know, it's great. We saw a lot of the different use cases for like net DevOps. There's a lot of certification and learning. Um, you see people using this for verifying their network security as well, testing fail points and simulating what would be attacks and how the network performs on that. So there's definitely a lot of use cases, um, as you saw on the slide. Oh, so there's lots of different um, roles you can take on inside CML. Now, as far as 2.6 goes, this is something we're pretty excited about. So if you've been a CML customer for a while, you know that it's been previously on-prem exclusively, where you had to either house this on your own VM workstation or your own bare metal server. Um, but now we have the ability to deploy CML into the user's Amazon environment. So no longer required to buy that um, server, install, maintain, update. It's all done through your Amazon AWS EC2 environment. So there's a couple of general requirements and we have again documentation on how to actually go about doing this. Um, but you'll need a couple of different tools. You'll need the AWS deployment tool. It's uh, basically Terraform. You'll have to have that installed in your local machine. You also need to have the AWS command line, the CLI tool. So you'll need those two tools and you also need the access to the AWS console. So if you're a personal user and you have your own um, Amazon environment, then no need to worry, but if you're in the organization, you'll probably need to get with the person that owns the AWS environment so that you have the permissions to create or modify that environment. Now, likewise, if you're a US-based federal customer, this is also exciting news because AWS has a uh, certified federal gov government cloud, the AWS Gov Cloud. So it's also running on that AWS EC2 environment. So you can also deploy CML into that. Um, we're also looking to support multiple cloud for providers in the future. So Amazon was just kind of our first jump into the cloud space. We really would like to hear you know, what your preferred cloud environment is if it's not AWS. So feel free to add that into the chat um, or you can ask about it in the Q&A later on. Okay, so we will take up our next polling question related to what Dalton was just asking about. Um, if you are interested in, in cloud, definitely let us know here, but this is for all users of CML. What would be your preferred um, deployment model? Right now, it's been on-premise only as either a VM or bare metal, uh, but with uh, 2.6, we now have at least AWS as a deployment option, um, but some people have also um, asked about uh, the last option there, which is as a hosted service. And that's essentially CML as a service. So you'd sign up and, and uh, instead of having any hardware or even bringing your own license, you would use CML through that, that hosted service. So all of these are um, potential. And we're just trying to gauge interest at this point. Um, not to say that, that at, the end of this, uh, at the end of this survey, uh, some of these are going to be immediately available, but we would like to understand what people want the most. So that's where we can prioritize. So it looks like on-premise VM is still winning out. Um, I certainly uh, like it that way. I, I have it uh, uh, deployed at home here on one of those trash can looking Mac pros on VMware. And um, even though it's at home because VPNs are, fairly ubiquitous these days. Um, I can uh, access it just about anywhere. Uh, and this allows me to run uh, a few larger VMs on, uh, on, on my deployment versus like just running it on my laptop. Uh, but self-managed AWS is coming in second. So it looks like 2.6 hit a good spot there. And not surprised, well, now we've got hosted service popping up, which isn't surprising. We, we have heard um, from, from quite a few people that CML as a service uh, would be very useful because you, you don't have to, you, you pay for how you use CML and, and you also don't need to build up those, um, you also don't need to build up those compute resources. Um, 
In terms of other cloud providers, it looks like though Azure and, and GCP, uh, we probably could have had other uh, cloud provider there as well. Um, those are coming in below, but it seems like overall the people, we have 38 people uh, participating so far. Uh, seems like on-premise VM and cloud AWS. So we hit some good sweet spots. Um, and, and clearly as a service is something that we have to, we have to continue to, um, uh, to look at. So thank you for that. Uh, we will go back to our, our slides. And now we've got our demo, uh, uh, demo section uh, where we'll be looking at some of the more visible uh, new features to 2.6. And we've got two of our core engineers that will walk you through that. Justin is going to uh, take you through the UI workbench. So the main UI that you see, some of our accessibility and, and because people said exam study, I kind of like some of these features for uh, optimizing some of my exam uh, studying or some of my studying in general and maintenance mode. So Justin, please let us know what you got. Thanks, Joe. Let me go ahead and share my screen. One second. Okay. Assuming everybody can see my screen here. Um, so what I have here is a fresh install of 2.6, latest version, CML. Um, I have a sample lab here. When you go into, so the workbench has been completely revamped. Uh, it's the biggest change that we've done uh, to the workbench to date. Um, so in the past, we've solely been migrating away from the hover menu uh, in favor of a right context menu. Um, that's been enhanced, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the big thing that you'll notice right away, though, is that the sidebar here is no longer present, uh, nor is the bottom pane. And this has been changed um, to allow for a couple of different things. Um, so first, the sidebar um, being changed. So that's in favor of a unified um, editing of nodes or any element, essentially nodes, links, and annotations. So when we added annotations in the previous release, that was edited in the sidebar. Um, whereas the nodes and links were still in this bottom pane. And historically, we had this concept in CML of whatever was selected inside of the canvas here um, would dictate what was selected in the bottom pane. And that's somewhat preserved in the sidebar. So like if I select a node, you see the sidebar pop uh, over here to allow you pop out um, to allow you to edit it. So you have the settings just like you would have had previously on the bottom bar, um, connectivity, config, et cetera. Um, if you select a link, um, you have the uh, same options that you would have had available in the bottom pane um, and same for annotation. So that's all been unified on this sidebar. So this would be where you edit all of the elements inside of a lab. Now for the adding of nodes, that's been moved up to this toolbar. And you'll notice the toolbar has moved from the left uh, to the top. Um, depending on which version you're running, I think some of the very early versions of CML had it at the top, but we went from the top to the side, back to the top. Um, and that's essentially to allow for uh, more space because um, when you have the nodes pane pop up here or um, the other panes, it you know, would conflict a little bit here. So we moved that to the top to avoid that conflict. Um, so for adding nodes, that is done via the add nodes button, uh, which is here in the toolbar. Um, if you click this, you can now search for a node type that you want to add. Um, you still drag and drop, so that function functionality hasn't changed. If you click and drag, the menu will disappear temporarily. You can drag where you want it, let go, and then you have your node. Um, an additional feature that we have new to 2.6 is this bulk add mode. And this allows you to add multiple nodes of a given type at one time. So if I wanted to do, we'll call it uh, like routers. So you specify a name, um, you specify node definition. Uh, let's do like CSR 1000. You specify a number that you want to add. Right, we'll do five. And then you can specify an X, Y offset. So by default, it will stagger them um, by, or sorry, by, def by default, yeah, it'll um, stagger these by 50. You can specify the offset here. Um, and if I do add, it'll do a 50 offset for those. So we have um, those five nodes added. And then you, once they're added, you can drag them wherever you want. Um, additionally, you can, there's a couple new shortcuts for accessibility I'll go over real quick, uh, which are Alt-In. 
So alt in will open this um, add nodes menu as well into the bulk add. And the reason behind this is to be able to add nodes without using a mouse. So you can do all of this via keyboard. You can essentially tab through the various elements here and then add, um, and that'll allow you to add um, nodes without using a mouse. That was something that we've been asked about. And then additionally, we have Alt-C, which allows you to, again, add a, uh, in this case, a link without using a mouse. So both of these features were for accessibility. Um, in this case, this menu would pop up, or this dialogue, you would specify source destination for the link. It'll automatically populate the next available interface. Um, one other interesting thing that we've added with this Alt-C is if you highlight two nodes and um, Alt-C, it'll automatically populate that. So that's another way that you can add a link um, if you want. So you can highlight two nodes. It has to be two nodes. If you do three, it won't work. If you do one, obviously it won't work. But if you have two nodes selected, Alt-C will pre-populate this and then you can create the link quickly. Um, you can still add a link like you would in previous versions by uh, right-clicking, add link, and drag and drop. That also populates this, or pop up, pops up this dialog. Um, so decoupling size, so pain. So this is, so what was the reason behind all of this? A lot of this uh, um, functionality was changed to allow for this split or this multi-pane view. And what this multi-pane view allows you to do is to have a combination of either console, VNC, or uh, packet captures um, in these panes at the bottom. And this can be split. So by default, you have one pane. Um, if you hit the plus arrow, it'll add an additional pane. This blue highlight that you see here is specifying the default pane, which new sessions will open in. And I know that's a lot to go over, but um, so the way this works is if I have this left pane selected, um, I can right click on a running node. And if I hit console, it'll open the console and the default tab. If I want, I can move, uh, click and drag the tab over here and I'll move it back and forth. And then I can do another one. So now we have routers one and two open. Um, if I click on the right side, it'll set this as the default tab, and then I can open, say, a packet capture. So now I have side-by-side -side console um, and packet capture. So I, what I can do is start a packet capture here, go on, uh, I guess these are better yeah, name these wrong. This are, yeah, let me rename this. Uh, So there's already some CDP traffic, but I'll go ahead and do a ping just to show you. So you can see the ping uh, in real time while you're on the console. Um, another use case for this, if you wanted to compare like router configs, you could do something like that where I could, whoops, drag this over here. And then if you wanted to do like a side-by-side -side show run, you could do something like that and then just kind of compare it line by line. Um, and this also works for VNC. So if I did a VNC, I can open that. Um, and then you have VNC there as well. Um, as far as renaming these, you can do that as well. So by default, these will open the icon specifies the type. So there's different icon for the different session types. If I right click, I can rename, uh, to something else if I want, um, So that's a, a way that you can make it uh, more identifiable. Um, and another important note is these panes are stateful in your browser for your user. So if I um, like went in, let me do a new lab. If I go into a new lab here, by default, I see just a blank session. If I come back into here, you have to open the sessions again, but the panes are all there. So that is stateful. Um, and right-clicking on tabs is also how you would access the different settings. So for a serial line, you have, you know, console settings, uh, you can download the logs, um, you can change the serial lines. I'm not sure how many people know about that feature, but depending on the devices, some devices like the XRV 9Ks have a couple extra serial lines, which you can access by changing this, um, or you can close session. If I do it on a VNC, I have different options. So this is how you this would be how you would send like a control alt delete or you know go full screen or um, but the rename and close are the same i don't think we have anything for packet yeah packets just rename and close um 
So I mentioned previously about the hover menu going away and moving towards the right click menu, which we've been solely doing. Um, this has been enhanced as far as from a context menu uh, perspective. So if you right click on a node, it will show you actions that you can perform against that node. If you do a link, you have actions for the link annotations uh, for annotations. If you uh, multi select, so if I uh, shift drag select all these elements and then do a right click. Um, you have an action line for each of the different types of elements that are defined. So like if I did console here, it would open a console for all of those nodes, assuming that a console was available. Um, if I deleted it, it would delete all of those nodes. So, so for example, if I right click all of these nodes and do delete, it'll say confirm deleting five nodes, and then you can confirm that. We also have, as far as uh, keys, if you select anything in the ca canvas and hit delete, it'll, uh, do a shortcut to allow you to delete all of these different elements as well. So that's, that's new. Um, panes, context menu, console settings. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm missing off the top of my head. So panes went over that sidebar. Um, yeah, I think that's it as far as accessibility. And then one other thing, um, as far as features, we do have maintenance mode, uh, for two, six now, and that's allows you to. Um, essentially block non-administrators from being uh, able to log in. So you're putting the system in maintenance mode and that's available. I mean, I guess it's for essentially enterprise. If you're a personal, I don't know why you would really use this, but um, more of an enterprise feature, but you would enable this by going in system maintenance, um, specifying that you want to enable maintenance mode. And then um, you would specify a message that you want to display. And when that is saved, um, you'll see the banner message across all the pages. If you're non-admin, uh, you won't be able to log in at this point. Um, additionally, there are notices that you can do as well. So if you wanted to specify like, hey, there's going to be some, you know, plan maintenance coming up, for example, um, you can specify that. Um, it'll show the message to all the users. They're still able to log in with a, just a notice. So they would still be able to use the lab, but if, you know, hey, we're going to be shutting the server down from, you know, eight to 10 tonight, you can specify that. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's it for the demo. Pass it back to you, Joe. Thank you, Justin. That was great. Uh, and we got a ton of questions coming in, some of which I've marked uh, to be answered out loud, so we're, we're not ignoring you. Um, we're just going to uh, answer them. Um, we've got to save some to be able to answer in the Q&A section, but uh, the, the panel has been prolific in answering some of these questions. Um, so next up, we've got a video from, we have Virtual Ralph uh, talking about this new feature called Patty, uh, which he teased, uh, just now teased in the Q&A section. Or set new capabilities, uh, especially around device access, uh, serial mm -hmm. ports and console, console access and VNC access uh, as an alternative for the breakout tool but also a, a new capability, which is part of the, the name of, of the service. Uh, it, it can also now do port address translation. So let's go to the first slide here. So what is it? By accessing the IP address of the controller, you're now able to either talk directly to a TCP or UDP port on a node that is running inside of your lab. Um, for example, uh, to talk to an SSH daemon uh, or to use uh, SNMP on that device running inside of a lab. And it also allows you to access serial reports and VNC displays of these nodes running inside of a lab. And it does this by adding or using tags on these nodes that, that define what that access should look like. So what port should be mapped to what inside port in on a specific node, um, as we will see in, in a minute here. There are a few requirements here. So first of all, the service itself is not enabled by default. It, the product ships with this service, but it is off, like in the same way as the SSH access is turned off. So you, to, to use it, you actually have to enable it um, and to configure it to some extent, especially if you want to have device access. Uh, so then yeah, you need to configure it first. Um, 
If you want to use port address translation, then there is a specific requirement, which I will show you in, on the next slide, uh, that these nodes need to be directly accessible from an external connector. So it, it doesn't work uh, if, if there is no routable path to that node. Uh, so that's just a prerequisite at this at this point. Um, and uh, for the device access, that always works. So you can always access the serial ports and BNC ports on these devices inside of a lab using PADI. Now, as I said, there are some requirements, and and we can see this see this here, right? So, um, this guy here, this needs to be uh, configured for network address translation mode. So it doesn't work in bridge mode, but then it would also not be required in bridge mode because then you could directly access these devices. So, um, these guys here, this one and this one, this one and this one. Uh, they are all directly layer two adjacent uh, to our controller. So either by going through this uh, unmanaged switch or going through this layer two uh, iOS device here. So they all can acquire an IP address uh, from the controller on this NAT interface or on this NAT network. Um, these guys over here, they are not. So these guys, they all sit behind this routing device. So the network in here and the network in here would be different. So they cannot be used for the port address translation part. Um, as I said, um, all of these guys, they can be um, accessed using uh, the serial port access, the console access, or the, uh, the VNC access for devices that support it. Um, but they cannot use port address translation if they're not layer two adjacent to the, the external connector. Uh, okay. As I said, you need to enable this thing um, and uh, that is being done by uh, either cockpit, like the, the service part in cockpit. So you need to uh, go into cockpit in the services section and then find the PADI service and enable that. That's pretty much the same thing as, as with SSH, uh, the, the system SSH service. Um, and then the, the configuration file is, is in uh, this directory or this file basically. Um, and what you want to do is you, you can uh, reduce the, the pole timer here to, to a smaller value, especially if you're the only person running on the system or using the system. And then if you want to use device access, then you need to remove this hash mark here in front of it uh, so that uh, that will be enabled. Otherwise, it's only the port address translation part that is enabled uh, and not the device access port part. And, and then how, how to configure it. Um, as I said, there is uh, tags that are being used uh, for this, for, this uh, for PADI. Um, for everything that is port address translated, uh, you prefix this with pad, and then uh, you you tell it basically the the port on the outside that it should listen to. So this is the port that is being used on the controller's IP address, and then the port on the inside that it connects to. Um, you can specify TCP. This is the default. Uh, and if you want to use UDP, then you uh, need to say UDP explicitly in here. So if, if this is not specified, like outside, inside, like shown over here, no, actually, actually not, this is specific here, it has the TCP in there, then it, it defaults to, to, um, to TCP. Uh, for device access, um, it's, it's simply like a serial and then the port number that you want to have it listen on and uh, or VNC uh, for serial, there is also uh, a way to access or to address a specific uh, console port, like for an aux port, for example, this would be uh, colon one, uh, it, it defaults to colon zero, which is the, the console port of most uh, of the devices. Um, as you can tell over here, here's an example, we want to access uh, on the desktop here, the, the secure shell daemon that runs on the desktop on port 22 by connecting to port 2022 of the con controller. Uh, same goes for the VNC access on this device by ad addressing the controller's IP address on port 5900, we want to be able to access the VNC device or the VNC screen uh, on that desktop device. There are a few things to consider. Um, 
as I mentioned before, this is pulled, so this is not something that happens immediately or isn't event driven at this point in time. So you need to wait uh, for a bit, uh, depending on how long that that pulling interval is, uh, to create and remove these mappings. Um, there is also currently no port conflict resolution. Um, so if you run this on, uh, or like if there's multiple users running this on the same system, then you, you need to manually do this uh, address conflict resolution, if you will, by, for example, assigning a block of addresses, uh, not addresses, ports that specific users can can use. Let's say, you know, first user uses 2000 to 2100, the next users, uh, user uses uh, 3000 or, or something like of that nature. Um, and the troubleshooting is a bit, um, you know, tricky, I would say at this at this stage. So um, you need to look into the service logs if there's any conflicts, etc. So uh, we will likely have a phase two of this, uh, depending or depending on on user feedback. Um, you also need to be aware that all of this is uh, insecure. So like especially like console access or VNC access, that's all in the clear. That's also the reason why uh, the, that that is even you know commented out in the default configuration file for Patty. Um, so you need to be aware that this is uh, in the clear. Um, it's not a problem if you run this locally on your laptop. I mean, everything will stay on your laptop, but if you, as I will show later in the demo, do this over the internet, then you need to be aware that all of this is going to be in the clear and everyone could, could read your passwords if you if you console to um, to such a device. Um, so yeah, that's something to to remember and to consider. All right, demo time. So what I have here is a controller that runs in the cloud um, that has this topology loaded that I was just showing in the presentation. And we see various nodes in here. Um, and uh, so like this guy over here um, has a serial, like all of them, they have serial ports configured like with different, like this is 2000, 2002, 2001, and so on and so forth. Like even those in the red box, they have like 2005, 2007, and so on. So I can access these guys by connecting to my controller on, on these ports that are specified in here. And some of these, like in the green box, they also have port address translation configured. So like, for example, this guy over here has port address translation configured on port 2022 um, going to port 22 on this host itself. So I, I should be able to, um, well, I will be able to connect to my controller's IP address on port 2022, and that will switch me through to the SSH daemon running on this particular machine. Um, and then there's also BNC access defined in here, or for this guy, I think there is uh, a UDP port address translation configured to go from port 2161 on the controller's IP address to port 161 on this guy's IP address. So if this would be running an SNMP daemon and I would be having uh, SNMP management tools installed somewhere or network management station, uh, that network management station will then be able to talk to my controller's IP address on this particular port and eventually ends up on the SNMP daemon on this iOS instance over here. All right, so let's see. So we want to, first of all, we want to go to uh, this desktop's uh, IP address over here. So the desktop is uh, 20, uh, 2000. So let's see, Telnet on port 2000 gets me direct to uh, this machine over here. And as you can tell, I, uh, it's, it's also showing in the uh, GUI on the left side, I can uh, log into this system just fine by directly connecting to the IP address. So I connected to the IP address of my controller over here on that particular port. No authentication, no breakout tool running, just, just telling it to the IP address of the controller. And by having this tag in there and having Patty running, you're directly switched through to the console port of that particular device. So um, what else? We have the port address translation over here on port 2022. So if we go here and say, same IP address, but in this case, we use SSH um, and say the port uh, 2022 and say uh, Cisco add. 
and it asks me for my password. And I'm again connected uh, to this machine over here um, by SSHing to my controller's IP address. So this is port address translation um, in action here, where I have a direct TCP connection to this machine. Uh, it does, it's not installed. Anyway, you get the idea. And then uh, last but not least, for the same machine, we also have a VNC connection. So let's uh, exit here and do uh, again uh, VNC viewer. And this, in this case, it's this particular port that I've that I've specified up here. Um, and uh, I need to bring this over here. So I get a warning that this is unencrypted and I get my viewer window over here. So I hit continue. Uh, and again, it's opening up on the other screen. And I, I get the, the VNC viewer of that machine by directly connecting to uh, the address of my controller over here. So we have all the possibilities here to connect to these, to these various devices using PADI and um, using the tags defined in here. And as I said before, uh, these guys over here, they cannot be addressed by, um, by PADI or by port address translation. So I cannot SSH into this guy uh, because this guy doesn't have an IP address. So this, this, this network in here is different and this network in here is different. So it, the IP address of this host that it will acquire is not seen um, on the snooper running outside here. So I cannot port address translation to this guy, right? What I can do, however, I can still use this uh, serial access or like the device access to these guys over here. So on port 2005, um, I should be able to uh, connect to this guy over here, 2005. And, and yeah, I can. So desktop four is reachable on port 2005 as the tag specifies. Yeah, so uh, that's pretty much the demo of Paddy. Um, let us know what you guys think. Is this like a good alternative for the breakout, uh, considering that this is all insecure and unauthenticated, but but super easy and also like persistent because these these tags, as you define them, they're being stored with the lab. So if you if you apply some some schema or some regularity here, for example, all your all your labs that you work with, you always have, you know, router one on 2001, router two on 2002, et cetera. So like you have all that in there. And as long as you have no port conflict, you only run a particular lab at the same time. Um, you always can, you know, open up talent sessions to these particular ranges of ports and you always get to the same devices, which I think is of, of great use for labbing. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Virtual Ralph. Um, Patty is already getting various kudos, thumbs up, and uh, trumpets blaring uh, in WebEx here. Tom posted the documentation link for Patty in the chat in WebEx. So if you're interested in knowing more or going back and figuring out how you can configure it, um, definitely check that out. That takes us up to our last polling question uh, before we get into the Q&A. So let me bring that back up for everyone jump over to the final question. So based on today's demo, what other features would you like to see in Cisco Modeling Labs? So you've already seen now what we're offering in 2.6, which is available today. What should we be considering for future releases, uh, be it the next uh, like 2.7 or whatever comes down the road? Uh, what are some things that, that you just really wish were in, were in CML today? Uh, we got some people typing. I will uh, uh, hint at you that that we already are preparing for a 2.7. Um, I can't say everything that we're thinking of right now, simply because some things are not committed. Uh, but we do have we do have a roadmap, so I'm I'm sure that some of the things that that come in uh, we will hopefully have heard of, and, and we will be uh, we'll have some thoughts on on considering them. Uh, DNA C integration. I saw that come up in in the chat. Um, uh, I think Tom answered or Ralph answered that once. Someone answered DNAC is one of these very large uh, virtual machines and getting it in CML while it now is possible today, um, it's, bit, it's a bit challenging to get that kind of bulk out there. Um, 
image for Kali Linux, uh, that's certainly possible, more possible. It's usually a smaller thing. Uh, I will point out that um, if you go to, and I put the link in, in one of the Q&A uh, answers there, we have a GitHub um, repo, the CML community, where we have contributed node definitions. Um, Kali isn't one of them yet, but um, we are certainly welcome to add that. And then that could be something that more easily fits into CML. I see SD WAN on there, and and I think Dalton uh, mentioned it in his section. We're absolutely looking to talk to the engineering team uh, that's responsible for the the SD WAN, the the older uh, or old name, the Viptela uh, images. So hopefully we can start shipping them in CML by default soon. Same thing for the FMC and the FTDV nodes. Um, yeah, Apple Silicon. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now participating in this, uh, in this uh, webinar on my uh, M1 Mac. Um, this is more of a question of when, we're all, when will our node definitions support it? And that goes to uh, our engineering teams um, because we, uh, we just, we don't have the control over those nodes. CML itself will run just fine on Apple Silicon. You put an ARM64 Ubuntu image there, load CML on it. Um, and, and it'll run all day. It's a question of then what virtual machines can you get into, uh, uh, um, get on it. Um, we've got some other questions around other node definitions like wireless uh, and, and some of these I've, I've saved off. Um, so I've seen your questions come into the Q&A panel. Um, I've saved some of those off. So, so we'll be able to get to those in our, in our next section. Uh, and since we are running a, a little bit up on time, I'm going to switch over and we're going to ask our panel some of these questions and then we'll close things down. You can keep typing in here. Um, we will capture all of this. This is this is gold for uh, Dalton. Uh, he's probably drooling over there with some of these ideas. So we'll capture all of this so we, we know what our users really want when we're when we're building those roadmaps for the next releases. For now, let me switch back over to our slides and to our Q&A. And some of them, some of these questions I've marked as we will answer them live or out loud. So first off, Ralph, I'm, real Ralph, I'm coming to you. So, so unmute yourself. We got a few questions around wireless support in CML. And you saw it uh, pop up on the Slido. Um, questions are, do we have a WLC, wireless LAN controller support? Uh, what about wireless nodes in CML? Um, so Ralph, can you can you talk to us about what we can and can't do natively with wireless inside of CML? And I see you're still on mute. This is virtual ah, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, yeah, so, so what we do not have, let's start with what we do not have. We do not have any wireless clients that you can put into a, a virtual lab. So you would have to have something that is actually, you know, transmitting whatever, wireless. Um, but we do have the capability to run a wireless controllers inside of a lab. So that could be like a virtual wireless LAN controller, which is available on CCO. I think we do not include that in the reference platforms, but it, but it does work very well um, as, a, as a virtual node type. And I'm pretty sure that like on a CML community, there is a node definition for the wireless, for the wireless controller, virtual yeah. wireless controller. Um, what I then would suggest is that um, you get a, a cheap access point, like you know, a, a used access point from Cisco um, and, and connect that to um, your lab, to your wireless controller running inside of a lab using the external connector. And it will build the cap web tunnel into that controller just fine, assuming it has IP connectivity and that kind of stuff. And then you can connect your phones or whatever, like whatever you have as actual wireless clients to that access point, that physical access point and can you know lab away on your controller and do whatever you want within your lab, but your devices at this point in time, they have to be the wireless devices, they have to be physical. Yeah, thanks Ralph. Ralph. And while I got, oh, sorry, I, I uh, you faded out. I, I thought I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm good, I'm good, thank you. I just wanted to make oh. a joke, didn't, that failed. Oh. Well, you still have an opportunity. So why I've got you unmuted, another question that came in is around what are the uh, resources that are used uh, if I deploy CML in AWS? What, what should I be aware of there in terms of, of what can I expect uh, as a hit on my AWS account? Okay, so um, on AWS, the, the, the most important thing is that currently to support all node types, you have to go bare metal. I mean, that is just a requirement on AWS because they do not expose any 
um, nested capabilities, CPU flags that are needed for the nested capabilities on their non-bare metal flavors. So um, since we rely quite heavily on having uh, virtual machines running in a virtual machine, or like virtual machines running on a host, and if that host is already a virtual machine, we talk about nested virtualization. And um, that isn't very well supported on AWS. So for support of all the, the node types that we ship with, especially the 64-bit node types, we require uh, bare metal instances, and they are expensive. Uh, that's just a fact. Um, in terms of other resource usage, it's pretty lightweight. I mean, obviously, traffic-wise, you just have usually the control plane traffic going from the UI to the device, uh, to the controller, or like API usage if you use some sort of automation that goes back from your local device, laptop, whatever, to the cloud instance, the controller in the cloud. And um, if nothing is running, what you would end up with and what you typically would not do every time um, is the, the storage on S3. So you have to have some sort of the, the bucket there that has the, the images and the, uh, the Debian package or like the, the, yeah, the software, basically. And that would also cost you some money regardless whether the system is running or like whether you use it actively or you are not using it actively. But in terms of network traffic, that's actually you know not really worth talking about. Thanks, Ralph. Um, Justin, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, your demo around the uh, the new panes interface uh, seemed to be a hit. And we got a couple of questions on, am I able to, or what are your thoughts around being able to detach some of those panes, create like floating windows um, out of the console or the VNC windows? It's something that I definitely want to do. Uh, we've, we've discussed it internally. Um, I think the idea right now, and it's not a commitment at this point, but the idea that I've been playing around with is to have a separate tab or separate window in the same browser. So, you know, imagine you're running Chrome, you know, you can open a new window, a new Chrome window. And then from there we can do cross browser communication. So you could essentially pop out or enter a new uh, route uh, in the right page, which would have your pain view. And then the left would be the lab as it is. So that's kind of the idea that I've been bouncing around. Um, uh, there's some technical challenge to getting that working, but that's, that's the idea as it is now. So it's something we like to do, but still trying to figure out the details. And do you think uh, two seven, or you think it's going to be a little bit longer before we see more UI changes around that? Mm, probably beyond two seven. There's a lot of refactoring that's going on right now. I have to upgrade some various things, which is taking going to take a fair amount of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'd be nice two seven, but more realistically, uh, beyond two seven would be what I would say. Thanks, Dalton. Your turn. So we got a couple of questions around our newest reference platform, the Catalyst 9KV. Um, specifically, uh, what about feature support in that image? Um, I think multi-VRF was called out, but, but in general, um, probably good to address in general feature support in some of our reference platforms. Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely a hot one. So yeah, just one preface there. We female, we get our reference images from the actual BU that creates the hardware. So they actually design up their virtual image in their engineering process to do testing, validation, that sort of thing before they actually productize the hardware. So we get that virtual image directly from the BU and it's the same for the Catalyst 9K. Um, in fact, the one they gave us is actually still in beta form, beta state. So yeah, it is missing, I would say a few of the features that people are looking for. That being said, you know, we are looking to partner with these BUs a lot more closely. Um, like Joe mentioned, we're already talking with SD-WAN and the Firepower teams to get the images shipped standard. Um, but as far as, you know, adding new features and adding new features to, or adding new images, we really need to get back with the BU and um, kind of coordinate with them as far as, you know, the features that they include in their virtual images. So it is an ongoing effort, um, but I did just want to preface that, you know, the images and the features that are included on them, we don't have a ton of control over. We should probably yeah, also thanks, mention. We should probably also mention sorry, that. Uh, yeah, sorry that the uh, like we can talk to the business units about things we hear, but that's actually more effective when it comes straight from the customers through their like account team to right. BU. So if if you're using CML and you've got some feature you want in there, you want the Cat Nine K, you want 
to see access to the SD-WAN images just provided by default, you can tell us, but also it helps us if you are telling your account teams, your, your, your Cisco partners, like, hey, I'm using CML, I'd be much more likely to deploy this if I could get access to these things in CML. Um, that, that helps us, or, or these features on these specific REC platforms, like Nexus 9K is great, but we'd love to see some sort of ACI support in the Nexus 9K. Like we can tell them that it sounds much better coming to you through the account teams or from you through, through the account teams. Yeah, absolutely. Having customer voices are always louder than, than our own internal voices. Um, I'm going to take this last question and we'll close it out. Is there on node and image definition um, support? I, I, I will say that it, it can be a little bit um, clicky to get a, a new node definition added to CML um, and then get a new image imported for that node definition. Um, so right now there is no way to import node definition or sorry, image definitions, but they are kind of simple. It's just, I need to know a, a unique ID for this, a name. Um, I need to know what the file is and then what it, it, it's relevant to in terms of a node definition. Unfortunately, there's no way if you have multiple node definitions that can run a specific image, there's no way to clone those images or, or attach those images to multiple nodes. Um, you have to do that one at a time, meaning you have to import the image multiple times for those node definitions. Um, I will say that that's one of the things we are looking at for 2.7 is how we can simplify some of the node and image management um, to make it a little bit more seamless or, or frictionless for our users um, to get uh, nodes and specifically new images for those nodes up and running quickly. Uh, in the meantime, I, I point people uh, to the CML community. We don't have images there. We can't distribute the bits, uh, but at least you can find some of those, those uh, node definitions and some documentation um, that might help you uh, get up to speed a little bit more quickly when adding additional nodes um, or adding additional images for those nodes into CML. So I really appreciate everyone's uh, uh, interactivity in, in our three polling questions, as well as in our Q&A, uh, as well as attending. It sounds like uh, the demos went well. Like I said, we got a lot of those, those kudos in there uh, for the new features in 2.6. Seems like Patty is, is a hit and Ralph, uh, you got a call out for calling out the clear text there, which is, is great. Ralph is very security conscious, uh, making sure that, that people are, are fully aware of what doing some of these, uh, these things mean. But having the features, having the ability there is still fantastic. And if users are aware of, of, of the ramifications, turning it on can, can absolutely open up opportunities or capabilities that didn't exist before. Again, thank you for attending our webinar. We, if, if you'd like to stay in touch with the CML team, um, scan that QR code there and you can sign up and you'll get uh, future uh, information, announcements, invitations to, to uh, upcoming webinars. Um, and we're going to keep running these things. We've got a, a great marketing engine uh, behind us, people that can help get our uh, blogs out there. And I know you've seen some uh, from Ralph and Justin help get more of these webinars out there to keep the message and, and, and keep the momentum and energy around CML going. So with that, thank you for attending our AM session. I hope wherever you are, you have a great rest of your day or great end of the day, if the case uh, is. And um, for those of you who really want to hear it again, uh, we'll be doing this again live uh, with more virtual Ralph uh, this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you again. Again, have a great day.